I remember the night it started. The air was thick, unusually still for the late autumn winds that usually howl around our home. We had just moved to this old house, a hand-me-down from my grandfather. The place always had an eerie stillness to it, but I had brushed it off as superstition, the kind of stories people in the village whisper when the lights go out. I didn't believe in such things back then. But now, I wish I had listened. My wife, Samantha, was the first to notice something strange. She swore she felt cold hands tug at her blankets, heard soft, raspy laughter in the dead of night. At first I thought it was just the kids playing tricks, or her imagination running wild. But then it happened to me. One night I was awakened by a pressure on my chest, like something small but heavy was sitting on me, watching. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe. In the darkness, I saw a pair of glinting eyes, small and glowing, staring at me with a sinister grin. I tried to shout, to scream for help, but my voice caught in my throat. Then, just as quickly as it appeared, it was gone. I bolted upright, drenched in sweat, my heart racing. The next morning I told Samantha and her eyes darkened. It's a tokoloshe, she whispered. I felt it too. I wanted to deny it, to laugh it off, but deep down I knew she was right. The elders always spoke of these creatures, mischievous and malevolent summoned by jealousy or anger. They're small, barely three feet tall, with shaggy fur, sharp teeth, and eyes that gleam in the dark. They live to torment, to cause chaos in homes and tear families apart. At first I tried to protect my family. I consulted the Sangoma, who came with burning herbs and chanted prayers. She gave us muti, traditional medicines to sprinkle around the house to keep the tokoloshi away. We placed bricks under the beds, raising them off the ground as the elders advised. They say the tokoloshi cannot climb. For a few nights it worked. The house was quiet, peaceful even, but then it returned, stronger, bolder. I started hearing strange noises in the walls, scratching soft footsteps, a deep unsettling giggle that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at once. My children became withdrawn, their laughter replaced by silent, wide-eyed stares. They complained about seeing shadows move, things shifting in their rooms. My youngest, Sifo, refused to sleep alone, clinging to me with trembling hands every night. But the worst was the dreams. Horrible, vivid dreams where I was trapped in my own house, walking through endless dark hallways. I'd hear my family's voices, but when I'd turn the corner, they weren't there. Only the tokoloshe, grinning up at me with its razor-sharp teeth, waiting, watching. One night it went too far. I woke up to Samantha screaming, thrashing in her sleep. When I shook her awake, she was hysterical, her arms covered in scratches, deep, bleeding marks that looked like claws. The creature had attacked her in her sleep. I was furious, helpless. How could I, a grown man, the protector of my family, fight something I couldn't even see? I began staying up all night, patrolling the house with a baseball bat like it would do any good. But the tokoloshi was clever. It mocked me, made me question my own sanity. Lights would flicker, doors would slam, and objects would move on their own. But when I'd look, there was nothing. Nothing except that chilling laugh. I grew paranoid, snapping at Samantha and the kids. The house felt like a trap, closing in on me with each passing day. I tried to leave to take my family far from that cursed place. But every time we packed our bags, something went wrong. The car wouldn't start or we'd fall ill too weak to go anywhere. Then one night, as I lay wide awake, I realized the truth. This was personal. The tokoloshi wasn't just here by chance, it had been sent. Someone had cursed us, maybe out of jealousy, anger, or something darker. But who? I looked at my family sleeping uneasily shadows beneath their eyes, and I knew I had to protect them no matter the cost. The elders told me the only way to banish a tokoloshe is to find the one who summoned it, to break the curse at its source. Now I sit here, staring into the flickering candlelight, 
listening to the soft patter of feet in the distance, the mocking laugh that still sends chills down my spine. I'm not sure how much longer I can keep this up, but I will find who did this. I will stop them. Because if I don't, the Tokoloshe won't stop until it takes everything from me. Days turned into weeks, and the weight of the unseen presence in our home grew heavier with each passing moment. I was exhausted, worn thin by sleepless nights and the unrelenting tension that clung to the air. My family barely spoke anymore. We moved like shadows in our own home, too afraid to acknowledge what we all knew was there. One evening I visited an old friend, Jabu. He lived on the outskirts of town, far enough from the village rumors but close enough to know everything that went on. If anyone could help me, it was him. When I arrived, he was sitting on the stoop, nursing a beer. The minute I mentioned the Tokolosha, his face changed, hardening in a way I hadn't seen before. He nodded slowly. I thought I'd hear from you soon. You're not the first family to deal with this thing, you know. This kind of evil doesn't come from nowhere. Someone wants you to suffer. Who? I demanded, the frustration in my voice barely restrained. That's the question, isn't it? Someone close. Someone who knows you well enough to hate you this much. Tokoloshis don't come cheap. They're summoned with intent. I sat in silence, letting his words sink in. Someone close to me. My mind raced, trying to think of who it could be. Neighbors? An old friend? Family? No one stood out, but there had to be someone. Jabu offered to take me to another Sangoma, one he trusted more than the woman I had already consulted. He said this one specialized in dealing with dark curses, in tracking down the person behind such things. I didn't hesitate. I would have done anything at that point. A week later, I found myself sitting across from an elderly woman, her face lined with the wisdom and weariness of years spent dealing with the unseen world. Her hut was filled with the smell of herbs, and smoke curled lazily from a small fire in the center of the room. You've been touched by darkness, she said, her voice low and gravelly. The Tokoloshe has been sent to destroy your peace, your home, and your mind. But it is not the Tokoloshe you must fear the most. She looked at me, her eyes narrowing. It is the one who sent it. I nodded, already knowing what she was about to say. Someone close to you harbors deep anger, jealousy. Someone who watches your every move with envy. You must bring me something personal, something that connects you to the person you suspect. Only then can we break the curse. I left her hut with a sense of determination, but also dread. How could I accuse anyone close to me of such a thing? But I had no choice. My family was falling apart. I was losing them to this unseen evil, and I had to act. Back at home, back at home, I began to watch everyone with suspicion. The neighbors who smiled too easily, the family members who seemed too distant. I even questioned Samantha's cousins, who had always been somewhat cold towards us. But no one seemed out of place. No one stood out. Until one night, as I sat in the living room, staring blankly at the wall. A thought struck me. There was one person I hadn't considered, someone I never would have suspected. My brother. Cebu Ciso and I had always been close, or so I thought. But looking back, there were small signs, things I had ignored in the name of family. His business had failed a year ago, and though I offered him money to get back on his feet, he refused. Since then, he had grown distant, barely visiting, always finding excuses to avoid family gatherings. I remembered a conversation from months ago when he had joked about our father leaving me the house, the one we now lived in, while he received nothing. At the time, I laughed it off, thinking nothing of it. But now, with the Tokoloshe haunting us, it felt different. That jealousy, that resentment. Could it have festered into something more? The next morning I gathered my courage and drove to my brother's house. When I arrived I found him sitting outside as if waiting for me. 
He didn't look surprised to see me, and that alone made my stomach churn. Sibusiso, I said quietly. I need to ask you something. He didn't respond, just stared out at the horizon, his face unreadable. Is it you? Did you... Did you do this to my family? For a long moment, there was silence. Then, without looking at me, he spoke. You always had everything. The house, the family, the respect. And me? I'm just the failure, the one everyone pities. His voice was low, bitter. I didn't want it to go this far. But once you call it, you can't stop it. I couldn't breathe. My own brother. You summoned the Tokoloshe? I whispered, the words barely escaping my throat. He turned to me then, his face twisted with guilt and anger. I didn't know it would get this bad, Sifo. I just... I just wanted you to know how it feels to lose everything. I stood there, staring at him, my heart breaking. This was the man I had grown up with, the one I had trusted my whole life. And he had cursed my family out of jealousy. Without another word, I left. I couldn't confront him further. I knew what I had to do. That night, I returned to the Sangoma with a bracelet Sibusiso had given me years ago. She took it without a word, placing it into the fire. As it burned, she began to chant, her voice rising and falling like the wind. For hours, I sat there watching as the flames consumed the bracelet, the weight of everything crashing down on me. I prayed, silently, for the curse to be lifted, for my family to be free. And finally, just before dawn, the Sangoma spoke. It is done. I returned home, exhausted but hopeful. The house felt lighter, the oppressive air gone. For the first time in weeks, my children slept peacefully. Samantha smiled at me, though her eyes still held the shadows of what we had endured. But the scars of betrayal remained. I hadn't just been haunted by a tokoloshi. I had been haunted by the darkness within my own blood. A few weeks passed, and life slowly returned to normal. The oppressive weight that had clung to our home lifted, and my family began to heal. The children laughed again, their fear slowly fading into distant memories. Samantha started sleeping through the night, no longer waking to the sound of those sinister whispers. For the first time in months, I felt like a man again, like I had reclaimed my home, my life. But the guilt gnawed at me. My brother, Sibusiso, hadn't been seen since that day. He had stopped answering calls, and even when I went to his house, he wouldn't open the door. I knew I should have felt relief, maybe even anger at what he had done. But all I felt was sorrow. We were brothers. Whatever had driven him to summon that thing, it had come from a place of pain. Then one night, it began. It was a phone call, late into the evening. I recognized the number immediately, Cebu Ciso's. I hesitated before answering, a strange unease prickling at the back of my neck. Cebu Ciso, I said, my voice hoarse. At first, all I could hear was heavy breathing, then a frantic, broken voice I barely recognized as his. It won't leave me alone, Sifo, he whispered. It's here. It's in my house. I hear it every night, laughing, scratching at the walls. I see its eyes in the dark, watching me. It's... it's killing me, Sifo. My blood ran cold. The Tokoloshe, I whispered, realizing what was happening. Yes, he cried, his voice shaking with terror. I thought... I thought I could control it. But I was wrong. It's here now, and it won't stop. It wants me, Sifo. I felt a sickening twist in my stomach. The Sangoma had warned me. These things once summoned had a way of turning on their masters, especially when that master had summoned it for something as dark as jealousy. The Tokoloshi had been banished from my home, but it wasn't gone. It had found its way back to the one who had called it forth. Sibu Siso, you need to go to the Sangoma, I urged my heart pounding. You need to get help. She can stop this. I can't. I can't leave, he muttered, his voice barely a whisper now. It's always there, waiting. I see it in the corners of my eyes. I hear it, laughing. 
always laughing. Suddenly, there was a crash on the other end of the line, followed by Cebu Ciso's panicked shouts. Then nothing but static. I raced to his house. The roads were empty, the night unusually dark, as if the moon itself had hidden away. When I reached his home, I found it in disarray. The windows were broken and the front door hung slightly ajar. Inside the house was a mess, furniture overturned, broken glass littering the floor, and strange, deep scratch marks on the walls, like claws had been raking through the wood. Cebu Ciso, I called out, my voice trembling. There was no answer, only the eerie silence that filled the house. I moved through the dark hallways, my breath coming in ragged gasps. My brother's bedroom door was closed, but I could hear something on the other side. Soft, rasping breaths, like something was crouched just beyond the door, waiting. Slowly, I pushed the door open. Cebu Ciso was huddled in the corner, his knees pulled up to his chest, his eyes wide with terror. He looked nothing like the proud, strong man I had once known. His face was gaunt, his skin pale and clammy. He stared at me, but his eyes seemed to look through me, as if he couldn't fully register that I was there. It's here, he whispered. It's always here. I glanced around the room, the hair on the back of my neck standing up. The air was thick with something oppressive, something wrong. And then I saw it, a shadow, small and hunched, darting across the far corner of the room. My heart skipped a beat. It was the Tokoloshe, hiding in the shadows, watching us. Its eyes gleamed with malice, and a slow, mocking grin spread across its face. I could hear its low, raspy laughter, a sound that chilled me to my core. It wants you, I said softly, understanding now what the Sangoma had meant. The creature was feeding off Sibusiso's fear, off his guilt. It wasn't just tormenting him, it was consuming him piece by piece. I took a step toward my brother, but he shrank back, shaking his head violently. You can't stop it! he screamed. It won't stop. Suddenly the lights flickered, and the temperature in the room seemed to drop. The Tokoloshi stepped out from the shadows, its small, twisted body hunched low, its sharp teeth glinting in the dim light. It moved towards Ibusiso with deliberate slowness, as if savoring his terror. I wanted to fight it to grab my brother and run, but I knew there was no escape. This wasn't something I could hit with a bat or chase away. It was bound to him now by the very curse he had summoned. And then, as I watched, something terrifying happened. The Tokoloshi began to climb onto Sibusiso's chest, just as it had once done to me. He let out a strangled cry, his hands flailing, but it was no use. The creature's weight pressed down on him, pinning him in place, and I could see the life draining from his eyes. I tried to pull it off him, but it was like grabbing at smoke. There was nothing solid, nothing I could fight. It cackled again, a sound that echoed in the room like the crackle of dry leaves. In that moment I realized that the Tokoloshi wouldn't leave him until it had taken everything from him. His spirit, his sanity. It was feeding off his despair, his regret, and I couldn't save him. Not anymore. The last thing Cebu Ciso said as he lay there beneath that creature was barely a whisper. I'm sorry, Sifo. Then his body went limp. The Tokoloshi turned to me, its grin wide and cruel. But it didn't stay. It simply faded back into the shadows, as if satisfied with what it had done. I left my brother's house in the early hours of the morning, the weight of his death sitting heavy on my shoulders. The guilt I had carried, the hope that I could somehow save him, it was all gone now. I had done what I could, but in the end it wasn't enough. The Tokoloshi had claimed him. It had turned on its master, as it always does. I knew one thing for certain. You don't summon such dark things without a price. And Cebu Ciso had paid that price in the cruelest way possible. The Tokoloshi was gone now, but the scars it left behind would never fade. I haven't slept a full night in months. Every time I close my eyes, I feel it. Its presence, waiting, 
lurking just out of reach. It's like a weight pressing down on me, an invisible force pinning me to my bed, robbing me of my breath, of my strength. It started slowly at first, just shadows, strange noises, a feeling of being watched. I thought it was stress or bad dreams, but it wasn't. I remember the first night it happened. I had been tossing and turning, feeling restless. It was past midnight when I felt something strange, a weight on the edge of the bed. At first, I thought it was just a dream, a nightmare I couldn't shake. But then it touched me. Cold hands, rough and clawed, slid over my skin. My body froze in terror. I tried to scream, but my voice wouldn't come. I couldn't move, couldn't even open my mouth. It was as if my body wasn't my own anymore. The weight pressed harder, like something heavy had climbed on top of me. I felt a low rumbling laugh, deep and sinister, vibrating through the air around me. And then it violated me. The shame of it still burns in my chest. In my soul. I couldn't see it. Not fully. But I felt it. It was small but powerful. An unnatural creature that reeked of malevolence. Its hands were everywhere. Its presence dark and overwhelming. I couldn't fight it off. I couldn't do anything but lie there. Helpless. Praying for it to end. When it finally left, I was drenched in sweat my heart racing, my body sore. I didn't tell anyone at first. How could I? Who would believe me? I barely believed it myself. The next day, I convinced myself it was a nightmare. A horrible, twisted dream brought on by stress. I tried to brush it off, to act normal, but deep down, I knew. I felt the violation in my bones, in the bruises that appeared on my thighs, in the ache that wouldn't go away. The next night, it happened again, and the night after that. Each time, the attack grew more violent, more invasive. I would wake up with my sheets ripped away, my clothes torn. I could feel its breath on my skin, the horrible sensation of its body pressing against mine, forcing itself on me. It felt like I was being ripped apart. Not just physically, but emotionally, spiritually. I started sleeping with the lights on, hoping it would stop. I put charms by my bed, burned herbs, prayed. Anything to make it go away. But it didn't. It would come, night after night, taking what it wanted and leaving me broken. I began to dread the dark, the hours between sunset and dawn. I would stay awake as long as I could, drinking coffee, pacing the room, keeping the radio on full blast just to drown out the silence. But exhaustion always won in the end, and that's when it would strike. During the day, I became a shell of myself, going through the motions. People would ask if I was alright, and I'd smile, make excuses about not sleeping well. But inside, I was dying. The fear had consumed me, taken over every part of my life. I felt dirty, ashamed, like it was my fault. What had I done to deserve this? Why had it chosen me? Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore. I went to a healer, a traditional Sangoma, desperate for answers. When I told her what was happening, she didn't look surprised. Instead, she shook her head and muttered something under her breath. You're being visited by a tokoloshe, she said, her voice grave. A spirit, an evil one. It comes in the night, preying on women, feeding on their fear, their pain. I wanted to scream, to cry. I had heard stories of tokoloshes before. Small, grotesque creatures summoned by witches to cause harm. But I never imagined it could happen to me. This wasn't supposed to be real. It wasn't supposed to happen in my world, in my home. Why me? I asked, my voice barely more than a whisper. The Sangoma looked at me, her eyes sad. 
It was sent for you, she said. Someone has put a curse on you. Someone with jealousy or hatred in their heart. And now, it won't leave you until the curse is broken. Her words shattered me. Someone had done this to me on purpose. Someone had wished this horror on me. I didn't know who. I didn't care. All I wanted was for it to stop. The Sangoma gave me muti, traditional medicines to protect myself, and instructed me on what to do. She told me to place bricks under my bed, to keep it off the ground so the Tokoloshi couldn't climb up. She gave me herbs to burn, prayers to recite. I followed her instructions to the letter, hoping, praying, that it would be enough. That night I slept with the bricks under my bed, the herbs burning in a small dish beside me. I stayed awake, listening, waiting for the familiar dread to creep in. Hours passed, and for the first time in months, nothing happened. I didn't feel the weight, the cold hands, the horrible presence. I thought, just maybe, I had escaped. But as dawn broke, I felt it again. A faint, cold touch on my ankle. A soft, raspy breath by my ear. And then, the laughter. That horrible, mocking laughter. It was still there watching, waiting. The Sangoma's protections weren't enough. The curse was stronger than I had feared. Now, I lie awake every night, too terrified to sleep. I can feel it in the room, hiding in the shadows, waiting for me to close my eyes. I know it will come for me again, and I'm powerless to stop it. Each night, it takes a piece of me, my dignity, my hope, my spirit. I don't know how much more I can endure. All I know is this. The Tokoloshe won't stop until it's taken everything. I spent the next few days in a haze, the sleeplessness gnawing at my sanity. I couldn't focus at work. I could barely keep up appearances anymore. Every sound, every shift in the shadows sent a wave of panic through me. I jumped at the slightest creak of the floorboards, convinced it was the Tokoloshe coming for me, in broad daylight. I tried reaching out to people I trusted, hoping they could help me make sense of it all. But the words stuck in my throat. How could I explain something like this? How could I make them believe that a creature from legend was tormenting me? So, I stayed silent. Locked in my own private hell, the Sangoma's words echoed in my mind relentlessly. Someone has put a curse on you. I racked my brain, going over every person in my life, every argument, every slight. Who could hate me enough to summon a Tokoloshe? My thoughts spiraled, paranoia creeping in. Could it be someone at work? An old friend, even my family? One evening, I found myself pacing the small confines of my apartment, my mind racing in circles. The bricks under my bed felt like a mockery now. How could I think something so simple would keep this monster away? I could feel it watching me, waiting, always lurking just out of sight. Desperation led me back to the Sangoma. I begged her to find another way to give me something stronger, something that would end this nightmare for good. She looked at me with pity, but this time there was a weariness in her eyes. There is one thing, she said, her voice quiet, hesitant, but it's dangerous. If the Tokoloshe is as powerful as you say, breaking the curse could come at a great cost. I didn't care. I'll do anything my voice trembling with the weight of months of terror. Whatever it takes. She sighed and pulled a small, ancient-looking book from the shelves behind her. The pages were yellowed, brittle with age. There's a ritual, she said, but it's not something to be taken lightly. You'll need to confront it. Face the Tokoloshe head-on. 
The thought of that thing, this twisted, malevolent presence, made my skin crawl, but I nodded. What other choice did I have? She gave me a list of supplies. Rare herbs, bones of a bird, candles made from something unholy. I was to gather them all, prepare my home for the ritual, and wait for the tokoloshi to appear. When it did, I would have to trap it within a circle of fire and recite the words from the book. The Sangoma warned me that the creature wouldn't go down easily. It would fight back, try to break free. If the ritual wasn't done perfectly, it would only grow stronger. The next few days were a blur as I tracked down everything on the list. I scoured markets, contacted strange, shadowy figures, and spent more money than I could afford. But I didn't care. I was past fear now, past caution. All that mattered was stopping this thing once and for all. When I finally had everything, I sat in the middle of my apartment, staring at the pile of supplies. I tried not to think about what would happen if I failed. What if the ritual didn't work? What if I made it worse? But there was no turning back now. The night of the ritual, I prepared everything exactly as the Sangoma had instructed. I lit the candles, arranged the herbs in a circle, and placed the bird bones in the center. The apartment was filled with a thick, acrid smoke, the air heavy with tension. I sat on the edge of my bed, gripping the book tightly, waiting for it to come. Hours passed in silence. The anticipation was unbearable. Every flicker of the candlelight, every creak of the walls, set my nerves on edge. I could feel it getting closer, the air growing colder, the darkness pressing in around me. And then, it arrived. The temperature in the room dropped suddenly, the air thick with malice. I could feel the Tokoloshi's presence before I saw it. A shadow moved at the edge of the room, slithering closer, its laugh echoing faintly through the air. My heart pounded in my chest as I stood up, gripping the book so tightly my knuckles turned white. I couldn't see it fully, not yet, but I could feel it. Its weight, its eyes, burning into me from the darkness. I took a deep breath and began to chant the words from the book, my voice trembling but determined. The flames of the candles flicker, the shadows twisting violently as I recited the incantation. The Tokolosh's laughter grew louder, mocking as it crept closer. Then I saw it, its grotesque, twisted form, small but powerful, hunched and hideous. Its eyes glowed with a sickly yellow light, and its claws scraped the floor as it moved towards me, its grin wide and menacing. The fire from the candles suddenly flared, trapping it in the circle. The tokoloshi shrieked, a sound so piercing it rattled my bones. It thrashed against the invisible barrier, its clawed hands reaching for me, but I held my ground, continuing the chant. The room shook with its fury, the walls vibrating as the creature howled, twisting and writhing within the circle. The air was thick with its malevolence, the stench of sulfur burning my throat. But I couldn't stop. Not now. Suddenly, the Tokoloshe lunged, its body slamming into the barrier with a force that knocked me backward. My concentration faltered, and for a split second, the flames dimmed. No! I screamed, scrambling to my feet, my voice hoarse. I chanted louder, faster, pouring every ounce of my will into the words. The flames roared back to life, and with one final ear-splitting shriek, the Tokoloshe was consumed by the fire. Its body twisted and dissolved into ash, the dark energy evaporating into the air. And then there was silence. I collapsed onto the floor, gasping for breath, my body trembling. It was over. I had done it. But as I lay there, the echoes of the Tokoloshe's laughter lingered in the air, faint but undeniable. 
Even in death, its presence remained. And I couldn't shake the feeling that somewhere in the shadows, it was still watching, still waiting.